It's Friday here on Outpost Unknown, and you know what that means, everybody. We are exhuming the X-Files here. If you're a fan of the X-Files, hit that like and subscribe button. Journey with us as we work our way through one of our favorite television shows of all time. My name is Matthew. He's Jeremy. Hey, everybody. And tonight, we're going to no-ho on the Roho with the season two premiere <laughs> of Little Green Men. So we, we made it. We made it through season one. We're rolling into season two. How are you feeling going into this new season of the X-Files? Well, I'm excited because I remember from being a kid and getting into season two, like everything just got turned up just a little bit more. Like every episode seemed to be just better than the quality that they were bringing to us in season one. Now, I don't, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but little kid me thought so. So I'm really, really looking forward to diving in and uh, seeing if that still holds up. Yeah, yeah, I kind of have the same feelings. It, it seems like the season one was a hit, and so uh, the Fox Network gave them a lot more money to work with. Oh, yeah. And I think that with more money comes, you can do more creative things. You can expand the scope of what your the type of stories you can tell. You know, the effects get better, um, the makeup looks better, and so I, I think this is the season where X Files started to feel kind of cinematic on television whereas maybe season one a lot of them it kind of looked like tv and i feel like some episodes here it's like okay this this actually feels like i'm watching a movie every friday night on fox or whatever so um this first episode here little green men directed by david nutter and written again by glenn morgan and james wong uh usually this is a, a can't miss duo of writers they always write some really really great x files episodes um, of course they did squeeze um shadows which is it but they did beyond the sea they did tombs um ebe your personal favorite eve um and they did ice <laughs> of course <laughs> so so they have amazing amazing highs and eh, kind of low lows uh, but we shall see with little green men does it live up to our expectations of of 13 year old matthew and jeremy patiently waiting for season two to premiere sitting down watching it take us through it what's little green men all about i uh, it starts with kind of a sad brooding haunting molder narration of stuff that's going on in his world at that time and then things kind of focus into where he's at now that the x-files have been closed and he's doing wire some of the most boring wiretap duty i've ever seen the poor guy have to do. just listening to <laughs> Like a couple of insurance guys just talk about chicks in the background. He's eating a bunch of sunflower seeds, just yep. disposing them directly onto the floor. Like he is, he seems to be at the lowest low we've seen him at the show because he, he's just not, not motivated anymore. He yep. doesn't, he doesn't know where he's is. He's lost. As the X Files were shut down at the end of season one and the finale, they were closed down by Skinner and and whoever, and so now Mulder's got he can't go look for aliens or anything anymore. Uh, Scully seems to be doing well. She's teaching medical stuff at Quantico, I think. I can't remember. I can't remember the name of the facility that they flashed briefly, but uh, throughout this or the beginning of this episode she's teaching like autopsy stuff to other med students so she's she's kind of slipped back into her her medicinal role again and uh let me see she walks by she sees spooky in the hall or molder in the hall and she tries to be like hey buddy and he just <laughs> blows her off doesn't even acknowledge her yeah. existence just keeps on walking i was like and, what a douche <laughs> yeah, right like that was your partner. You got close to the truth, and then all of a sudden, you're just doing her like that. We kind of find um, out later in the episode, though, why he's acting like that towards her. Because yeah. later on, he he mentions, like, we cannot be seen together. And it kind of shows that he's actually kind of concerned about what may happen to her if they keep hanging out and doing stuff. Um, so we, we get that idea. But initially, you're like, holy shit. This guy's in a real dark place. Won't even say hi to Scully. So he goes back to his boring ass desk. Like he doesn't even have the cool office in the basement with the posters on the wall. He's just got a desk jockey job with the rest of the or FBI agents slumming it on a floor. What do you call that? A bullpen? Yes. Type seating. Like no walls near you. He's got room for one 
effect, a personal effect on his desk, and it's a picture of his sister. And when he gets to his desk, it's it's face down on the on his desk, and he's like, "Okay, what's this all about?" He flips it up. There's like a little sticky note attached to it. He reads it. And he ends up going to some clandestine meeting with Scully and actually talking to her this time. Um, apparently, the the face, his sister face down on his desk is a thing that or a sign that they two they need to meet. Mulder is mega paranoid when he shows up yeah. to that meeting, just saying you shouldn't be here for anything other than very very serious shit. She just wants to know how he's doing, and he's like, you know, Deep Throat fucking died. Like, there are people watching you, watching me. they got our phones tapped. They're watching every single move that we make. And if we make the wrong one, they may kill us. So this is dangerous to be doing this. And Scully just doesn't seem to believe it. At least most of it. Yeah, I mean, she was there. She watched Deep Throat get shot. Right. Um, she saw prolapsed eyeball Mulder get thrown out of the back of a van. I can understand why he's kind of like... Uh, we got to stay away from each other for a while. He's genuinely concerned, but yeah, it's true. She just doesn't seem to care anymore. She's kind of like, ah, no biggie, no biggie. And then she, she kind of gets to the heart of it with what's going on with him because she can't stand to kind of watch him fall apart the way that he is. Like he, he seems that he's no longer pursuing the truth. It's not a, or he's, it's not even an interest. He's put it out of his mind and it's, killing his character as a human being and yeah. she's really really concerned about it so she she comes up with this story about a uh, hail and the i think the the, the hail bop comment is named after him but he started an observatory down in san diego by yeah. convincing what was it one of the rockefellers or something to give him a bunch of money because of elves that only existed in his head yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then she uses that as as a maybe the only or only she uses a line. She says something like maybe the elves only existed in his head, but the the observatory got built anyway. And using that as maybe you are crazy, Mulder, but you still need to do X Files stuff. Cause yeah, because he's like he's like whole, putting his whole heart out to her. Basically, he's like, I'm questioning everything I've ever believed in. I don't even qu- I'm questioning now whether my sister's abduction was even real. Like this is getting to the core of everything Mulder believes in because he I, he even mentions uh, I think I wrote it down where he's like I have I have seen so much and I have no evidence of anything. Like zero, everything yeah. he's done, he's got no evidence, and he's just kind of like, well, maybe I am kind of nuts. Maybe none of this stuff actually happened. It's not real, and I can, you know, go do whatever. And she basically says in response, "If it makes you happy to be crazy, be crazy." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we we go from there to a a flashback scene where Mulder's sister gets. Uh, abducted yeah Yeah. samantha i remember this as a kid because this was a big deal uh because i remember in season one Mulder talking about how his sister was abducted and and stuff like that and that was always kind of a big thing that's kind of hanging over the show like a mystery like what happened to actually get to see this like i have i have a sister who's like 12 years younger than me um so um you know when i was 13 14 years old i mean she was super small but i kind of like even related to it a little bit because it was just kind of cool to see like that dynamic of a brother and sister kind of giving each other shit um, and like yelling at each other and stuff. And then, you know, she gets abducted and like how traumatic that would be to somebody to see her sister pulled out uh, by aliens. And we actually see an alien in this, which was, I think uh, other than the little tiny alien being pulled out of the jar, I think it's the first time we've seen a live in motion alien in the, in the series so far. Well, kind of, I mean, they, a door bust open, there's a bright ass light and there's like the outline of a very skinny humanoid thing. Yeah. There, but well, I mean, it's heavily implied it's the grays, but so, uh, yeah, I loved the, uh, the abduction scene, it was very close encounters of the third kind. There was a scene in that yeah. where 
the uh, UFOs were like blasting light through all the shutters inside of a house. And yep. They used different light colors, but it was very, very, very similar. Yeah. In how it feels. So I thought they captured that very, very well. And then uh, <laughs> for some reason, instead of floating out the door towards the alien, they float her out a glass window. And uh, <laughs> then he, he wakes up. He's in his apartment. He's all sweaty and gross. And this is a this is something I've noticed is we, we get a lot of sweaty molder coming up here. And I'm probably going to revisit this one over and over and over again. But this ball, this bald guy just opens the door to his apartment and says, but is this something about you're due at the Capitol? Yeah. <laughs> like just wakes him up in the middle. You're due at the Capitol. So he goes up to the Capitol. He's apparently visiting some general who's dressed in civilian clothes and he's listening to. Uh, oh, it's a senator. It's a senator because oh, oh. It's, it's Senator Richard Matheson. And of course, Richard Matheson is the great sort of horror sci fi writer, which is why they named him that. Uh, he did a lot of Twilight Zone episodes and stuff, but it's an actual senator. And this, this senator we find out is the one, because in season one, they always sort of hinted at Mulder's got friends and connections in government that kind of override what the FBI wants to, you know, they, they want him to kind of stay away from the X-Files in a way, but he's got these friends in high places. And we finally meet one, Senator Richard Matheson. And uh, he seems a little eccentric, not too wildly crazy, but definitely has comes across as really, really rich guy eccentric vibes thing going on he's listening to some classical piece and he's like do you know what this is Mulder?" and they have this little brief conversation it's like this this song is playing on the voyager spacecraft and, yeah you know after all of humanity burns away in a conflagration of the sun anybody who intercepts this thing will listen to the best of us or some shit like and puts him onto an assignment. Says that the Arecibo facility in uh, was it Puerto Rico, San Juan. Yeah. That uh, part of the SETI program has been listening to space through a, ra- or a satellite dish. Um, has received something. He has a single page paper. Says Mulder, you need to get down there and figure out what's going on. You only got twenty four so, hours before the blue berets destroy it all. <laughs> yeah, the fallen, the fallen angel recovery people. Show up, yeah. So. I remember as a kid being fascinated by SETI and all of that and, and just thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, when they get those weird, uh, not really, like, probably not transmissions or whatever or something, but you know, you'd ever hear once in a while, it's like, oh, we heard a strange sound coming from this star and the scientists don't know what it is. Could it be contact with extraterrestrial intelligence? I love that stuff as a kid. So the fact that he was going down to one of these gigantic like satellite dishes looking for quote unquote contact. I was eating that stuff up. Also the movie contact with Jodie Foster because of that. Oh yeah. Matt just explained. Excellent sci-fi movie. Yes. Um, We do get Skinner and cigarette smoking man are back by the way, this episode. There was a, Oh yeah, hang on, hang on. <laughs> but who are they? They were they talking to Scully? They didn't they ask yeah. Scully like because Mulder disappears to San Juan and they immediately go to Scully and say, you know, the guy's off the reservation again. Yeah. Where the fuck is he? And she's like, I don't, I don't know. Well, we see we see this kind of thing later on in a, in a subsequent episode here where where Skinner. There's a great moment we'll get to it, but once again, where Mulder's on these tedious assignments. And Skinner is kind of like, well, <laughs> dude, uh, you want to explain why your homicide case is not important and sort of thing. And this is just another thing. Mulder thinks all this work is beneath him and he just leaves, like straight up leaves and tells nobody. <laughs> That's a fireable offense right there. <laughs> right. But, well, okay. Not in this world. Man. Yeah, not in this world. <laughs> He's got friends in high places. So, so he ends up in uh, Puerto Rico. He ends up hitching a ride to the outside of this closed down facility. I think said he stayed open at least through one of the James Bond films being with the uh, what's his face being filmed. But anyway, yeah, it's closed now. I don't remember it being closed then. But he goes up to the front gate, knows, noticed that, it, that it's locked with a chain. 
and decides to like proceed through the woods until he just stumbles upon it and then gets up to the control room itself pulls out a tape recorder and starts talking about it <laughs> and he does it through the rest of the episode and it's not bad but i realized that they want to communicate Mulder's internal monologue to the audience but they yeah. can't figure out how to do the haunting narrative over the top of it so they just use the tape recorder to tell their dumb, dumb audience what he's thinking about at that time but I, I love that part where he goes up to the exterior chain fence can't get through the lock walk sweats his ass off walking through the woods to get to the control room and then pulls a pair of bolt cutters out of his backpack and cuts the <laughs> chain there just cut the fucking chain <laughs> <laughs> that was through three miles of jungle back there bud but, yeah all right you know i i when i guess when i saw him sort of you know with the tape recorder kind of talking into it i guess i just kind of went with the idea that his whole thing is he's got no evidence of anything and he was trying to like describe everything in as much detail as he could that he was seeing and they would keep that tape recorder on him so that he could like at least refer to like I literally saw this because he was questioning earlier on in this episode he's questioning everything he's ever seen and known like and and so I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll give him some leeway on the tape recorder. Well, it it did early on, but later on he's like waxing poetic about the nature of his work <laughs> over. True. Yes, that's over true. old boy's dead body, and it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> I like when okay, Scully. So- I like when Scully's trying to find him. That, that's one of my favorite things of this this episode is when a Scully goes into his apartment and checks his answering machine, and you get this weird, like, unidentified woman who is basically saying Mulder hounded her to have lunch, and then stood her up and he called she calls him a pig and then hangs up yeah. and, and scully just kind of like huh yeah. sounds like him <laughs> she also had kind of a husky voice and if i remember his love interest from england and out of season one she also oh, yeah had a domineering husky voice too so maybe he just has a thing yeah Could be but she thing. goes back to his apartment she hacks into his computer she guesses his <laughs> password which is the infamous trust no one password that I used on my Hotmail account for <laughs> decades from 1996 on. She figured it out in three tries. <laughs> it's it's yeah. like, well, come on, Mulder, you gotta you gotta uh, keep that thing a little tighter. <laughs> put a put a dollar sign at the end of that or something. I mean, <laughs> nah, this was the mid 90s. People weren't even sure what to do with <laughs> passwords and stuff. He's like got that. so much important shit. On that computer, probably, and he and Scully can just get into it in three tries. True, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she finds uh, she finds this document of all of the documents because she's basically staring at a screen that has nothing but file folders that have access to documents, and she just finds the right one to look at to kind of get an idea that you know it's a it's a signal pattern, the thing he got from the senator that shows that there was some sort of signal detected from space. She hits the print button as the door starts opening on the apartment. And I don't know if you guys remember those printers from back in the nineties, but you could hear somebody printing throughout the whole of the fucking house. Yeah. (laughs) They were loud. Somehow It was covert enough that it just barely got done as they came in. Uh, they're like, what are you doing here, Scully? This apartment is under surveillance. For the first time, Scully realizes that, oh, Fox wasn't just bullshitting me. He <laughs> was actually being observed. Like, well, he's gone. He didn't say anything about it. He told me to feed his fish. And then she goes, or they they look around the apartment. They see this printer paper sitting on the floor. Looks at it. It's like, oh, this is just a print test thing. Just balls it up, throws it away. <laughs> And then has this stupid scene. She's like, okay, how do I get this paper out of the trash can without them noticing I'm taking it? So she just dumps fish food all over all over the top of the, the aquarium. She uses the paper to like clean it up and then she balls it up up in her sleeve and then she leaves without feeding the fish. <laughs> Unbelievable, Scully. <laughs> But uh, then it cuts back to 
uh, Mulder in the facility. He's like, he's uh, he's noticing that a bunch of the equipment is on, that it's recorded a bunch of stuff. He's listening to crazy things. Then he hears something. And he opens this closet, and there's this, this uh, Puerto Rican fella just... Oh, <laughs> by the way, Mulder is so fucking sweaty at this point. Like... <laughs> He's wearing this sleeveless t-shirt and he is soaked from his neck all the way down to his belly button. His pits are gross. He's just damp. Like they took, they, I don't know. Somebody looked at season one, looked at tombs and like, you know what? More of we that. Need more, of that. Yeah, more of that. He is just wet. And then he hears something. He busts open this closet door and this wet Puerto Rican is in this closet. <laughs> Doesn't speak any English. Just starts rattling off a bunch of Spanish to him. And he's like, no, no, no. Uh, what are you talking about? I, You know, I actually translated. Really? The guy said, oh, I did. Okay. It said, uh, lights in the sky, red, blue, and orange. Oh. I thought a small plane crashed in the trees. But when I arrived, I saw men, like animals, but not men. They grabbed me and put me here. They are still in the forest. And then that was the end of that conversation. But they don't understand anything he's saying other oh, than the word cool. hombres. He's like, hombres, men? <laughs> and the guy draws a picture up on the wall, and it's the head <laughs> of a gray, the elongated skull, the large almond-shaped eyes. And so... It's another go- it's another classic X-Files moment where someone does like a drawing profile of something, and it's like three lines. And it's like, oh, of course alien <laughs> it, it worked for me better than titty big <laughs> titty bigfoot big titty big, bigfoot <laughs> so uh it cuts from there it goes to scully she's got the paper she's just happens to be talking to the one guy at a university that mentions the wow signal do you remember or have you ever heard what the wow signal is uh, I had heard of it before, but I couldn't really remember exactly what it was when I watched this. See, I knew a lot about UFOs and mystery shit. Like you do, we it's what well, we read a lot of. It yeah, then. I had never heard of the Wow signal until fairly recently. But back in like '77, uh, Ohio State, I think, recorded a signal or a set of signals from space that were just so bizarre and so well timed that it couldn't have been anything but artificial. And then ultimately it went away, but it's, or they make mention of it in this episode. And I wish I was paying attention to some of this stuff, like how they're drawing correlations between events that had actually happened in our real world. And yeah. In there, but it says that, you know, the piece of paper that you're showing is a signal along the lines of what the wow signal was, but so much stronger that, that's basically evidence that there's something out there. If that's real and you can come back to it and find it over and over and over again, like you've got something very, very scary on your hands. Yeah. Which Scully at this point already knows aliens exist because she literally pulled one out of like liquid nitrogen and was staring at it. So one thing I, what I think is kind of interesting about this episode is I I guess the way Scully kind of portrays it, she seems kind of like shocked by this news. Not like, oh my God, there's aliens, but she just kind of plays it as she, holy cow, like, wow. But I'm like, Scully, you already know this is true. Like you already know there are aliens out there. So why would this surprise you? I mean, no, she really saw was, you know, baby, frozen baby. (laughs) It didn't look great, but. All right, so ho on the rojo. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the next uh, note I have is no ho on the rojo. But he tells him that after he pushes the fucking red button. <laughs> like uh, Jorge is walking around looking at all of these panels and just decides to, out of the blue, just press this red button. And he's just turning it. Says, hey, you know, no ho on the rojo. Oh, God. It's like every cartoon in the night is like Red and Stimpy, the giant red button. Don't touch the red button. That was like a thing. Don't ever touch the red button. Come on, Jorge. Yeah. It's universal. What? You should know that. I think it's. I think it started with Knight Rider when Kit was telling 
the Knight Rider not to don't pr- don't press the red button, Michael. And it, it did the turbo boost thing, and we've just been doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so we he says noho on the rojo, and then all of a sudden we get another abduction scene. Like the same blue and red flashing lights, bright white light from Mulder's sister's abduction. Door busts open. Um do they see? Does, yeah, he does see uh, an alien. Just like it was almost yeah. exactly like it was when he was a kid. Yep. Only Jorge isn't getting levitated out. He just sprints outside <laughs> into this wild tropical storm that's going on at the time. Bad idea, so Jorge. <laughs> but then Mulder follows him. Like the light dies, the alien is no longer there. He runs out into the jungle, just starts saying, Jorge! <laughs> Jorge! <laughs> I forgot to mention earlier, I did keep a note out, that uh, this season was the beginning of the use of those sweet flashlight effects. That looked oh, like yeah. those hyper beam that we tried to recreate in our first movie, The Green yes. Horde. Yeah. And we never, I, we still should figure out how the fuck they did that. Because you you have a frame that is just clear, so they can't be just blowing a bunch of smoke and steam in there. there but somehow you just got these yeah, there's a, there's an actual Hollywood thing. I I can't remember what it's called, but basically what it does, you spray it in the air, and it'll it doesn't look thick like smoke, but when a flashlight hits it, it'll give it that sort of beam. So it's like smoke without the smoke. So it well, exists. It, it it this season you just started seeing it at the very very beginning of the episode when they started doing it, and it just looks. We, yeah. It gets back to that cinematic feel that everything has because yep. even watching this episode, there's a lot of camera angles. There's a or there's different choices about a lot of different things that they chose to do to give it that more cinematic feel. So for sure, there's a lot of things they seem to learn in the first season, and they just started experimenting and doing things very very well in this one. So he's running through the jungle. He ends up finding Jorge leaning up against a tree, apparently having been killed by the girl from Ringu, because he's like, <laughs> he's, he's stuck in a pose where he's dead of fear, and it yeah. looks just like <laughs> how those people died in that movie. His arms are like up, and he's like, ah, he's got that horrible look on his face, yeah. It looks cool though, and it looks creepy. It's a it's a creepy sort of thing because it just when someone like dies and they're like in a frozen in an unnatural state, I've always found that to be very creepy and unsettling. Gives me the creeping yeah. willies. Yeah, where was it? Uh, I think it was the first The Ring movie where they found that girl in the closet. Oh yeah, yeah, and her head just tips over to the side. Yeah, like, that yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. Weird. Probably the scariest part of that movie. They just showed The Ring uh, not too long, about a month ago here in, in Lincoln. And listen, I went to go see it. And that that moment, even though I know it's coming, I know it's coming. It's still just goosebumps all mm. over. Ugh, it's it's awful. <laughs> well done. Yep. Um, so he, he drags Jorge's body back to this, uh, this command booth thing for... The satellite dish. It just happens to have a table long enough to put a, a body on. And Mulder is bad. Like, he thought he was sweating a lot before. He is, <laughs> it is just raining off of him, just dripping onto the floor. He's got his tape recorder out. And that's when, that's when I noticed that it's just there for us to hear the narration monologue stuff. Yeah. Because they normally only do it at the beginning of the end of the episode either Scully, Scully or Mulder talking about things that had happened. So it was weird to do that in the center of, a, of an episode, but he just has this whole conversation with his tape recorder about what is real, what is not. I don't have any evidence. We have the X-Fund. And then all of a sudden the aliens come back and he, he ends up locking a door throwing a very expensive piece of equipment in front of it, and then enthusiastically shouting, No! (laughs) And the aliens stop. (laughs) It's like the Darth Vader in Revenge of the Sith. No! (laughs) It was was weird that he got them to stop by just saying no really loudly. But 
Okay. Maybe you scared so, him off. Uh, you know, when you encounter a bear, you're supposed to make yourself big, and that makes the bear back away. Maybe that's what aliens are like. Yeah, okay. So the greys respond to alpha males. Yeah. Oh, all right, <laughs> Just get right. big and yell at them, and they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll turn around. <laughs> Come on! Yeah, all right. All right, I got it. So then uh, Scully shows up. She comes into almost immediately after that had happened, if I remember. Well, there's a whole sequence here where she shakes a tail at the airport. There are these two, like oh, yeah. these two FBI agents or something that are following her, and they're in these ridiculous, like Hawaiian shirts with these goofy hats, and it's like so obvious. And like Scully, like gives them the slip through. It, it's complicated. So like she's calling on phones and stuff like that. But eventually, that's how she gets there because she knows knows he's there but she doesn't want to be followed um and then yeah she just kind of like shows up just in time oh yeah yeah because Mulder passes out okay yeah. i remember that and then she wakes him up and she's like it's me it's dana scully <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in puerto rico with you and you know everything was fine she's looking around like okay there's you're very sweaty there's a room full of like discarded dot matrix printer paper on the ground. There's sound coming out of these machines. But, you know, it's not really that weird for me finding Mulder in this state. And then he uncovers Jorge's body in the corner. <laughs> Her whole demeanor changes like, what the fuck have you been doing? <laughs> and he doesn't, he doesn't really, he doesn't really explain it well. He's just like, yeah, fucking Jorge died. Yeah. He makes some sort of comment like some uh, really important moment for him personally, where he's like, my life has been about seeing them, these aliens. And what would I do if they actually came? It's like, well, exactly what you're doing in this episode, Mulder, you'd yell no and pass out. (laughs) That's what you would do if they came. And and your partner shows up and she hears you mumbling about aliens with a dead guy laying on the floor. (laughs) Probably. So, uh, then, they, they just kind of gloss it over. Like, there's this moment where she looks at him like, what the fuck have you been up to? And then they step outside and the crash retrie- or retrieval guys are showing up. Are the Blue Berets <laughs> actually a thing? Or is that just made up for the show? Have you ever heard of That's the Blue Berets? Okay. No. They, I, I'm sure they hadn't. They wouldn't tell anybody if they exist, but I've never heard of them. Okay. But anyway, they, they they imply heavily that this is the trash re- or crash retrieval fallen angel guys from season one, and they're coming up that they're hauling ass up a hill in a deuce and a half. They they're they're fully loaded with matching weapons this time. You don't have like one guy holding a pistol, and another guy holding an Uzi, and another guy holding an AK. They all have the same weapons. Got bigger budgets. budgets from, yeah, right. <laughs> they can and they can pay more of those prop departments to get actual good stuff. Mulder and Scully get in this this Bronco and just pull an Ace Ventura straight down the side of this mountain. That they're on. Like they they start on the road for just a second, and then it's just like like a glove. It just goes off road, bumping down the hill, and the guys like, oh, well, we gotta get them. So they're just going down this windy hill. Somehow they're not dying in this vehicle and rolling it over, but they get away. The crash retrieval team can't do nothing about it, but they have a job to do. Any or anyway, so they are they. Get... Mulder took that that little uh, reel, that film reel. Oh or, yeah, or yeah, right. Recording reel, uh, because he's they're trying. He he wants to grab all the evidence, and Scully's like, "We gotta get the fuck out yeah, of here we can't, now. We can't get that. We can't get that body through customs. So yeah. <laughs> instead of that, grabbing like fifty fulls of reams of dot matrix printer paper <laughs> he grabs like the little audio recording of what was it? it was just a message from voyager but slowed down wasn't it i think so it wasn't, yeah. like, anything of value on it compared to the data that was there but okay so they they get out get back to the country and we get skinner and the cigarette smoking man are in a room with Mulder, dressing him down Skinner's There's like, I'm going to suspend you, motherfucker. You're done. You just left. You you left your really highly entertaining and exciting wiretap gig to head to Puerto Rico. You're done, pal. 
And then the cigarette smoke, and this was the weirdest part of the scene. I remember cheering this shit on when I was a kid, but it made no fucking sense. The cigarette smoking man gets up and speaks to Mulder for the first time, I believe, yeah. in the show. It says, you've got nothing. You've got no evidence or some, something to that effect. Yeah, and he says, your time is gets- over and you leave with nothing. Yeah. And then Mul- Skinner gets up and is like, hey, fuck off, guy. Like, <laughs> tells him to... Tells him to gets angry and tells him to leave. Yeah, I don't understand why. I so here's how I understood that scene. I feel like up to this point, Skinner kind of um, doesn't really believe Mulder when he, you know, Mulder's coming. He's like, "There's bigger people here. There's there's all this crazy shit going on." And and Sk- uh, um, Skinner's just kind of like a useful sort of patsy who's kind of oblivious to what's really happening with the cigarette smoking man. And then as soon as the cigarette smoking man came over to Mulder is like, your time's over. You leave with nothing at all. I think that's when the light turned or clicked on for Skinner. That was like, Oh, wait a minute. The cigarette smoking man is actually an asshole and he is actually trying to fuck over Mulder. And maybe there is something here and I'm going to defend my guy. You know, that's how I kind of took it, but it is a really strange, abrupt change at the very uh, last minute there. It would have been nice if there was build up to that. Cause I love having bosses that are like that. I've always looked for yeah. them in life, but it, it, they were both chewing his ass. Yeah. Fixing to fire him. And then all of a sudden he's like, cigarette smoking, man, get, get fucking lost. I don't want to see you run no more. Yeah. And so he, he puts a cigarette out. He walks out, basically puts him or excuses. Skinner excuses. The absence and says you need to get back on those tapes and get back to your normal job and that's that we're not going to talk about this anymore and that was i believe the end of the episode. there there's one last little moment with with Mulder and scully and what i actually wrote wrote this down because i thought it was a really cool kind of like um kind of a loving moment between the two of them and we get this throughout the next few episodes too before Jillian Anderson has to leave the show because of her pregnancy um where they have these little moments and Mulder's talking to her and he says you know I may not have the x files but I still have my work because by the end of this episode he's kind of back to being Mulder so his sort of crisis of conscience of over his belief system at the beginning at the end of this he's he's come back around he's like okay i've seen an alien in the flesh now uh, all this stuff happened it's true i do have friends that are helping me out here now uh this this is i'm, I'm back i'm back to being molder and he said i may not have the x files but i still have my work and then he says and i still have you and then i still have myself and then it sort of ends the episode because she's oh yeah because he's in the He's in the area with the wiretap, right? And she's in there talking to him. And then the very end of the episode isn't him. He puts the tape back on and like he's ignoring whatever stupid mafia wiretap it is or whatever. And then he starts listening to that tape to try to hopefully hear something on it. So we as an audience know that Mulder, his passion and drive is back. We're we're in for a, a fun season two. All right, Little Green Men, what are your thoughts? Excellent first episode. With the last season going out with or with a bang like it did, we needed to come in strong. And the season opener is excellent. It leaves you starving for more. Yeah, yeah. More wet molder. That's what we're here for. More uh, <laughs> I was thinking as you're talking about how sweaty he is, one of my favorite sort of um, action sci-fi movies of all time is Predator 2. And one of the, my favorite things about that movie is there's a horrible heat wave going on in Los Angeles when the Predator shows up. Because, of course, Predator is attracted to heat and conflict and whatnot. And every character in that is sweating through their clothes. And it just it adds this grimy feel to it that really, really works. And so I kind of got sort of shades of that in my mind when you were talking about how sweaty Mulder is throughout this whole thing. Because if he wasn't sweaty, it it adds, or it takes away an element of discomfort that a human being would have in that situation. It's like, of course, he's in Puerto Rico. It's freaking hot as hell. Yes, he would be sweating through, through his clothes with anxiety and stress and all of that. And so again, gets to the cinematicness of of this you know um so yeah i totally 
totally agree with you. I thought this was a was a really cool opening episode. I think the the intro, um, like or I guess the prologue before the credits, I thought was the weakest part. It, it had some weird kind of goofy looking digital effects and they're talking about Voyager and Mulder has this weird sort of voiceover. And I'm like, I think they could have opened it with a little bit more of a bang than, than what they did. But the rest of the episode, I think makes up for it. Uh, I, and I, I quite I, like it. Honestly, I think the way that it was filmed, they wanted to open the episode with the, his sister's abduction, the pre-credit. Oh how long yeah. it was and or the, just the timing of it. But I think that somebody came back and said, this is too confusing to start a show like this because the, it doesn't involve any of our main characters or the storyline. It had been too many, too long, but I want to say that's how it felt like it should have opened. Yeah, that would, that would be, that's, that's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think the, the whole abduction part of it is really cool that we actually got to see it for the first time after a whole season of sort of talking about it. We got to see it. So lots of cool stuff in this episode. Definitely the right way to get season two off. And, and also showing the people it's like this is still a show about aliens and government conspiracies and stuff. Um, and, you know, I, th- I think to my recollection, like every season premiere of an X-Files season is something to do with aliens, right? We're establishing the overall um, plot uh, of what's going to go on this season. So I really, really liked it. A few interesting tidbits I got. Uh, it says this episode was specifically written for Mulder to question himself and his beliefs. And according to Morgan and Wong, one of the main themes of the episode is quote, the idea that we all have to fight our own little green men and carry on unquote. Um, Senator Matheson was named after the sci-fi horror writer, Richard Matheson, who wrote many episodes of twilight zone. Uh, and he originally was supposed to recite the episodes opening monologue, but I couldn't, find out why he didn't uh maybe they just wanted Mulder to to be the one to get people back in like oh, okay Mulder's talking here let's pay closer attention uh the flight manifest that Scully scans in search of Mulder is actually just a list of X-Files fans I guess they they went on uh X-Files like message boards and stuff back in the day and found a bunch of uber fans from season one and and put their names on there I was like well that would have been cool I would have loved something like that um, Jillian Anderson revealed on Late Night with Conan O'Brien that when she and Duchovny were filming the final scene escaping the Blue Berets, the actors portraying the soldiers had to pretend to shoot their guns and made their own sound effects, which caused the cast and crew to laugh hysterically. And I would love to see outtakes of that. That would be really, really funny. And the episode... To... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I want to go back and look and see if their mouths are going... Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Uh, the episode marks the first visualization of Samantha's abduction by aliens, although there are discrepancies between the depiction of her abduction in this episode and Mulder's description of it in the, both the pilot and conduit. Car- Chris Carter has attributed this to the unreliability of Mulder's hypnosis-induced memories. I think that's Chris Carter saying, uh, I just keep writing it a different way every single time. <laughs> we'll just blame Mulder's uh, faulty memory for it. And on See, first I- few- Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm re- why do I remember from when I was a kid seeing that scene, but they weren't at home. They were at a hotel. Oh, I don't remember that. I My recollection of that whole scene was that it took place way later on in the X-Files. Like, I was kind of shocked that this whole sequence I remembered was so soon into the series, like first episode of season one i thought that was way way later and that's one of the things that i thought was kind of interesting about this episode is they explained a lot a lot faster than my memory remembered it being explained maybe that's just as a kid you're watching it and it feels like it's a much longer time or something but yeah it's yeah interesting uh and on, on last one here on first viewing the fox executives hated the episode and wanted it completely redone um so another example of the suits uh, not understanding what awesome sci-fi is but luckily chris carter uh, stuck to his guns and uh we have little green men to kick off season two so with that uh we're gonna wrap up this episode is there anything else you wanted to mention about little green men all right next week very very exciting episode for me because uh this is one of my all-timers all-time favorite episodes we're going to talk the host and it happened to have been written by chris carter himself uh so we're going back to 
monster of the week episodes um and and i can't wait to talk about it so check back next friday here on outpost unknown for another episode of exhuming the x-files hit that like and subscribe thank you for the people who are commenting and, and subscribing based on the show we really really appreciate it at some point here i'm going to be able to get everybody's comments and i will address them on the show but i keep forgetting to put them in the word document and i feel bad so uh, but we are reading your comments and whatnot so thank you for putting it and we'll see you next